Hey guys, this is a hopefully brief review of differentiation techniques and essentially all the different ways of mechanically looking at and finding derivatives. Uh, let's get started. So let's say we're asked to analyze this function uh, y equals x squared or f of x equals x squared. In fact, let's make it a little more col colorful. So x squared plus 5x minus 6. Now, when we find the derivative of this function, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, in fact, let's make it a little bit more fun. So let's say we have this. This gives us a bunch of things that we can do with it. So th there's a bunch of different ways that a question can be differentiated. One of the ways that you can differentiate it always is with the definition of the derivative. And whenever we say definition of the derivative, there's two limits that should come to mind. It's the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And the other limit that should come to mind is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Now, when we find derivatives at a particular point, the x and the x are what get replaced. And in the other example, the a is what gets replaced in the numerator and in the denominator. So we need to be careful when we're finding just the derivative of a function. Well, then it doesn't matter. There's nothing being plugged in. But if you're being asked to find the derivative of a function at a point, then you have to know where what is being substituted. So this is always the first way that we can do things. And because we've done enough practice with both these approaches, we know how cumbersome they are, how algebraically intense they are. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts, and these problems tend to be uh, very weighty in their grades as a result of that. The next thing we can say is, hey, we can find the derivative using the power rule. The power rule simply says, if you have uh, the derivative of a function that looks like x to the n, where x is a variable and n is any real number. The derivative of this function is n times x to the n minus 1, which seems like an even more covert bunch of letters. So the thing that I would like for you to remember is bring down the power. and subtract 1. That's really what that expression is saying, that whenever you have, say, uh, you need to find the derivative of x squared, you bring down the power 2, you write your variable again, and then you subtract 1 from the power. 2 minus 1 is 1, so this is really just 2x to the first power, which is the same as simply saying 2x. That's why the derivative of x squared is 2x. Now, had we found the derivative using the limit definition, we would have gotten the 2x as well, just after considerably more work. So that's a power rule. Uh, very rarely, if ever, will you get a straightforward question like this. The question uh, that you will get with power rule will always be something that requires ABC, algebra before calculus. So it might be something like this pdx of 2x plus 4 times 3x minus 1. Now, if the question says you're forced to use the power rule on this problem, we cannot do that yet because not everything is in the form x to the n. I have a product of functions here. So the first thing I would need to do is some algebra before calculus, ABC. I would first need to FOIL it out which would give me 6x squared plus 2x minus 2x plus 12x so plus 10x. And then 4 times negative 1 would give us negative 4. Now, do we have you know a polynomial that I can find the derivative of? Yes, so now you can go ahead and apply the power rule. So in questions where the power rule needs to be used, the application of the rule itself is so simple 
that it doesn't rise to the occasion. It doesn't, it's not a good test question to just say, hey, differentiate this with a power rule. Nine times out of 10, the question will appear in a manner that requires you to do some algebraic manipulation first. And once you've done that, then you can start taking the derivative using the power rule. Uh, then we have the sum and the difference rules. And there's, these are really quite simple. This is just saying that if you have to find the derivative of a sum or a difference of two functions, what you can do is find the derivative of just the first function by itself, find the derivative of f, and then to that or from that, add or subtract the derivative of g of x. This is very similar to a limit property that said, hey, if you're taking the limit of f plus g, you can take the limit of f and you can take the limit of g and just add them together as long as both limits exist. Here, it's the same argument. You can take the derivative of f separately, you can take the derivative of g separately, add them together and say that this is my derivative as long as both of those individual derivatives exist. If either this does not exist or this does not exist, we can't go anywhere. Question's over, we cannot apply the rule. Then we have to do something else. So to use the previous example, if uh, this is the one I'm talking about, if we were to find the derivative of 6x squared plus 10x minus 4, technically speaking, and no one actually does this, and I'm not expecting you to do it, but this is how the sum or difference rule would actually get implemented. You would say, hey, I have a sum of two functions here, so I can split it up using the sum rule and say, the derivative of 6x squared plus 10x would simply be the derivative of 6x squared plus the derivative of 10x. And then because there's a subtraction of 4, we would say that using the difference rule, the derivative of 4 goes by itself. Now you can use the power rule to find the derivative of 6x squared. You can use the power rule to find the derivative of 10x. And we know that the derivative of 4 would be 0 because it's a constant. Next, I want to bring in the constant multiple rule. This is also something that, you know, formally allows us to do one of the things that we do without thinking about. But the constant multiple rule really just says that if you're taking the derivative of a constant times some function, k is a constant, that's the same as saying, hey, I'm going to yank the constant out of the derivative and then just take the derivative of the function itself. Whatever answer I get to the derivative, I'm going to multiply it by the constant that we pulled out. So in practical terms, this is what this looks like. I'll copy this again. And again, no one in their wildest dreams would ever actually write this on a test. You'd never be able to finish anything if you did. But this is the formal justification for what we just take for granted. These derivatives individually would be 6 times the derivative of x squared plus 10 times the derivative of x minus, well, here we don't have a constant, so you could, if you really, really, really wanted to push your luck, do that. So you can take the 4 out, that leaves a 1 on the inside. Now, this complex we can simplify by using the power rule. This complex can be reduced by using the power rule. This is the constant rule, so derivative of 1 would just be 0 because 1's a constant. So as I said, the, these rules allow us to formally give us, they give us formal permission to do some things. They allow us to find the derivative of this function, 6x squared plus 10x minus 4, and say, hey, I'm just going to find the derivative of this, which would give us 12x. And then, hey, I'm just going to find the derivative of that, which would give us plus 10. And then I'm going to find the derivative of just this, which would be 0, so that's gone. 
the thing that allows me to do that, it, it has to be mathematically guaranteed. The two rules, the sum and the difference rule, and the constant multiple rule are what give me permission to say, hey, I can sort of take this apart uh, into three different derivatives, then pull all the constants out. Instead of doing all that, I'm just going to take the derivative of this piece, then this piece, and then this piece, and then glue all the answers together. That's what those two rules sort of guarantee behind the scenes, that it will work. The downside of these two rules, the constant multiple and the sum or difference rule, is that students will incorrectly think that this extends to products and quotients as well. So what is not the product rule is students thinking this, that, well, if I have two functions being multiplied, when I'm adding them, I can separate the, the two functions and find the derivative separately. Why wouldn't I be able to do that here? So the derivative of f times g is not f prime of x times g prime of x. Very, very common mistake. Please make sure you're avoiding it. This will be tested on the next exam or on this upcoming exam on Monday. So please make sure you're rock solid on this. Which leads us into what does the product rule actually say? The product rule says, if we have to find the derivative of a product of two functions, my recommendation would be to label this function as the first function and label this function as the second function. A reason for this, and I think Jerome does a very good job in AP Classroom of explaining this, is that you don't have to have f as the first function and g as the second function. This might be h of x times t of x, or it might be p of r times l of r. And then you don't want to sit there and putz around with, well, what is p, what is l, is that f, is that g? It's a lot better to say first and second, and then memorize the following sentence. Derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. I might say, hey, Jerome gave us a different order or gave us the terms in a different uh, orientation. And that's fine. For the product rule, you can reverse the order of things and it, it's not going to make a difference. And I'll show you why. So the derivative of f of x times g of x, using this notation, would be derivative of the first. So now I'm reading part of this and then doing it as I go along. So the derivative of the first would be derivative of f of x, which would be f prime of x times times the second. So that's just the plain second function. I'm not doing anything with it. Plus, plus, it's starting to look like a minus. I'm going to get rid of it. The derivative of the second, so that is g prime of x, times, times the first. So here just f of x comes around. Now hopefully you remember the commutative property of addition and multiplication. It basically means that if you're doing 2 plus 5, well, you get 7. Well, what happens if you rearrange the terms and you reorder them to 5 plus 2? Well, you still get 7. If you have 2 times 5, you get 10. If you rearrange to 5 times 2, you still get 10. This commutative property is only available to addition and multiplication. It does not work with subtraction or division. A uh, very clear answer to that would be 5 minus 2 is 3. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. So commutativity breaks here, but it does work here and here. So if, you know, Jerome might say the second times the derivative of the first, well, if he says that, then that's really just g of x times f prime of x, which is the exact same thing as right here. We just rearrange the terms. So again, the, the thing that I want you to remember from here, visually speaking, is that you're taking the derivative of one of the functions and keeping the other one the same, and then you're flip-flopping them. You're taking the derivative of the other function that was the same and then keeping the first one identical. So you can think of it as the prime switching functions. So 
sometimes will, students will say, well, the F gets the prime here and the G gets the prime there, and that's okay. I would just caution against memorizing this with Fs and Gs because it's very easy for uh, the problems to sort of throw you for a loop if you're banking on Us and Vs or Fs and Gs. So be careful with this. Um, going back to the original question, x squared plus 5x minus 6, and then x minus 3. Let's find the derivative of this as many ways as we can that's reasonable. So obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious, but hopefully you recognize that this is a product, and therefore the product rule should be used. The way you would recognize this independently or maybe on a test is I'm always, and, and I always do this even now, uh, after as many years of teaching calculus and doing problems, I still will read this out in my head. So I would say x squared plus 5x minus 6 times x minus 3. So I've trained myself to look out for or be on the watch for these specific words or phrases that are of import. The moment you hear the word times, when you're reading a function from left or right, you should be thinking, hey, I need to be able to use the product rule here, or I need to use the product rule here somewhere. So this is my first function, our first function. This, on the other hand, is the second function. Now notice here, we have f of x, so I can no longer use f of x as the first function. Another reason why first and second tend to be a better phrasing for the product rule as opposed to f and g. So if we have to find f prime of x, I have to find the derivative of the right-hand side. And here, as an accounting trick, I did this in class, but I, I always prefer to write something like this down. So this is just a reminder, and it helps me keep track of which derivatives I've found, which terms I still need to incorporate, and which ones are fine. So the derivative of the first, just sort of like f prime, f is for first, not for f of x, times the second, so that's the s for second, plus the derivative of the second, s prime, times the first. So again, f does not mean f of x, f is just short for first. So as we find these things and we go from left to right, we should mark them as we see them derivative of the first. So the derivative of x squared plus 5x minus 6, hopefully you recognize, is 2x plus 5 times. So once I do it, I cross it out as a way of saying I've dealt with that piece. Times the second. So the second is just x minus 3. That goes away. Plus, plus the derivative of the second. The derivative of the second would just be 1. So that goes away times the first, which is x squared plus 5x minus 6. And that's it. If the question does not ask you to simplify, don't. Don't mess around with it. Leave it exactly as it is. For the sake of proving something in about two minutes, I am going to multiply this out, and you'll see later why. So if we foil this out, we would have 2x squared negative 6x plus 5x, so that's negative x, negative 15, and then adding 1 is not, or multiplying by 1 is not going to do anything, so we would just have x squared plus 5x minus 6. Now we can combine some like terms and get 3x squared, so that's these two terms. We have a negative x and a positive 5x, so that's going to be plus 4x. Then finally we have negative 15 and negative 6, which is negative 21. So keep this in mind as we progress and try something else. Let's copy down the function again. Now, let's say the question says, hey, find f prime of x two different ways. Or maybe the, the question binds your hands and says you cannot use the product rule to find the derivative of this function. If you can't use the product rule, then power rule tends to be something that you want to think of as an, as an alternate. You don't want to go to something heavier like chain rule or quotient rule, even though we haven't done those yet. I'm sure you, you've sort of sensed that they require more work.
So here, again, we, we incorporate or espouse the principles of ABC, algebra before calculus, which means what happens if I FOIL this out first? I would have x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5x squared minus 15x minus 6x plus 18. And if we clean this up a bit, uh, x to the third would just be by itself. Negative 3x squared plus 5x squared would be 2x squared. Negative 15x minus 6x would be negative 21x plus the 18 at the end. So all the terms have been accounted for. Now what I can do is I can take the derivative using the power rule. So if we find the derivative of x cubed using power rule, we would get 3x squared. 2x squared's derivative using power rule would be 4x. Again, I'm bringing down the power and subtracting 1. The derivative of negative 21x would simply be negative 21. The derivative of 18, notice that this 18 is freestanding. It's not attached to a variable x or anything else. That 18 is a constant. The derivative of a constant is 0, so that term vanishes. And you'll notice that both of these answers are identical. And they should be. Just because you find the derivative of a function using power rule does not mean that the answer will be different using product rule. The difference will be the stage of simplification. So if you were to compare this answer and this answer, they're not visually the same. But if you were to multiply this out and simplify it and get it to look like so, then you say, hey, look, they, they really are the same exact function. The derivatives are the same. Now, I won't do this, nor would I ask you to do something this insane on a test. We could find the derivative of this function using the limit definition. It would be quite tedious, and I don't think you would learn anything new from doing that. So it's not a worthwhile exercise. But as a way of maybe a multiple choice question where they might say, which of these techniques could work? So you would say, hey, the power rule definitely works because I can FOIL it all out. I can definitely use the uh, product rule, obviously, because it's a product. And I could try to use the limit definition of the derivative as well. The question might say, you know, which of these four techniques or five techniques cannot be used to find the derivative? So then you might have three that do work, and then one answer choice of a technique that should not be used here, or that will not work. There's two others, the general exponential rule. and the general log rule. So the general exponential rule is, is I, I don't want to say it's my own concoction, but it sort of falls out very nicely once you marry the exponential rule and the chain rule. Again, we haven't done chain rule yet. So we're just going to come up with the rule itself. I'm not going to give you any justification, but I am giving you permission to use this should you wish to. Here, this applies to any general exponential function. So as a reminder, for an exponential function, the variable needs to be in the power, and the number needs to be in the base. Now what we're saying here is that the, num uh, the power doesn't have to be just a single x, it could actually be a function of x. When that is the case, this derivative is calculated in three parts that are all multiplied together. So the first part is the ln of the base. The base is a, so ln of a times, and here's where you copy down your exponential function again. So notice a to the f of x, a to the f of x. No difference, you just copy down your question. Times the derivative of the exponent. The derivative of f of x would be f prime of x. So let's see this in a very quick example. Let's say you're asked to find the derivative of uh, 7.3 raised to the 4x squared. First, we need to make sure that this indeed is a, an exponential function before we apply the exponential rule to it. Is this base a number that's positive but not 1? Yes. Are the variables in the power? Yes. Therefore, this is a general exponential function. And if we were to find the derivative of this using the rule we just learned, we would have ln of the base, well, the base is 7.3, times the function itself. So I'm just going to copy down 7.3 
raised to the 4x squared times the derivative of the power itself. The derivative of 4x squared would be 8x. And that's it. You don't touch it. You don't get any points for simplifying this further. Please don't, well, first of all, lose time, and then on top of that, lose points by doing something you don't need to. This also applies to, you know, anything that has an e in it. So if we have e to the 3x squared plus 6x, the derivative of this function would be ln of the base, so ln of e, times the exponential function itself, e to the 3x squared plus 6x, times the derivative of the exponent. So 3x squared's derivative would be 6x plus 6, which is the derivative of 6x. Now here, very common mistake, please don't forget these parentheses. If you do, then the only thing you're multiplying are these two terms and then this additional term here. You're saying that this 6 is not being multiplied by the first two, which it surely is. So that would be incorrect. You must use parentheses there. Then we have the general logarithmic rule. which says that if we have to find the derivative of the log of some function, it doesn't have to be log of x. It could be, but it could be log of x squared. It could be log of 3x squared plus 6x. It could be any of those things. And it has some base b. I, I don't know what the base is, but this is arbitrary. This would be the same as f prime of x, which is the derivative of the argument. The argument is the thing that you're taking the log of. It's the derivative of the argument over ln of the base, now in this case the base is b, times the function itself. Let's see this in action. Let's say we're asked to find the derivative of 2 to the x, 3x squared, let's say. It would be ln of the base, oh, I'm sorry, f prime, uh, oops, this is exponential, sorry log of 2 of 3x squared. My mistake, I was writing down an exponential but thinking of log. So here we would start with the derivative of the argument. The argument is 3x squared, so the derivative of that would be 6x over ln of the base. The base is 2, so it would be ln 2, times the function itself, 3x squared, or the argument itself, 3x squared. Let's do another one ddx of ln of 5x cubed minus 6 radical x. Now, as a rule of thumb, whenever I have to find derivatives and there's radicals involved, before I take the derivative, I again go back to abc. I simplified algebraically. So I would say ddx of that function on the left-hand side still equals the derivative, because note, I haven't taken the derivative yet, all I'm doing is, is I'm rewriting the function so that it's easy to differentiate. So 5x cubed minus 6x uh, to the 1 half. That's what I'm really finding the derivative of. So we apply our rule. What's the derivative of the argument? The derivative of the argument would be 15x squared minus 3x to the negative 1 half over ln of the base. Well, for natural log, the base is e times the function itself that we just took the derivative of. So 5x cubed minus 6x to the 1 half. And that would be your answer. You're done at that stage, and you would stop. I like two other very, very small details, but very important ones. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. These are all the derivative rules that we have for this, for this particular unit, for this particular test. In the future, we will have more rules for implicit differentiation, logarithmic differentiation. Um, what else do we have? Quotient rule, chain rule. So we'll have a bunch of different ways of doing these problems in the near future. I hope that this clarifies things a bit. Uh, if and when I have time tomorrow, or if I get any requests from students, I'm happy to make any other videos clarifying things as well. But please feel free to reach out if you have made it all the way to the end of this video. 
If there's something you would like clarity on, please let me know. I'm happy to set aside some time to make a video. I hope you find this helpful.